Okay. I'll turn off my, my camera. And... Okay, welcome. And thank you for and thank you for joining the webinar on bias and resistances exploring challenges to gender equality in leadership and decision making. This webinar is co-organized by the Getting Roles Project in the framework of their Work Package 5, Leadership and uh, GE Academy. Getting Roles is a strong multidisciplinary consortium of 10 European academic and non-academic partners that will design, implement and evaluate six gender equality plans following the steps described in the gear rule in the gear tool with the firm objective of challenging and transforming gender roles and identities linked to professional careers and work to, towards real institutional change through the giving roles project coordinated by the university of deusto six new gender equality plans will be implemented in six european institutions our focus is on the deconstruction of sexual roles in order to unveil often unconscious gender biases that operate in processes of decision making, selection and promotion of people and, the, and, the, and in the attribution of value and recognition. We follow the steps set by the GEAR tool. Uh, first, understand the context, evaluate the state of play in the institution, plan and set up the GIP, act and implement the GIPs, and monitor progress and evaluate the effectiveness of the chips of the chips our four main objectives are to remove barriers to female recruitment and device personal career development plan to provide alternative references in traditionally male dominated areas and in those where women are majority but kept under uh, glass ceilings to disseminate the common framework and open an output for institutional gender assessment, planning, monitoring, and evaluating to establish commitment to gender equality in major European stakeholders, organizations, and build a scientific production in relation to gender and feminist studies. And finally, to address gender imbalances in the representation processes and the promotion of women leadership in research institutions. For that purpose, we are developing different resources. You can find them in our web and also a set of webinars where this first one is framed. I'm sure that we are gonna enjoy it and we are gonna learn a lot together. And thank you very much again for your participation. Thank you very much, Maria, for this uh, presentation. I'm also, uh, I will share my screen. Uh, my name is uh, Vasa Matesi and welcome also from my side on this webinar. I'm representing the Gender Equality Academy project, and as Maria mentioned, this is a collaborative effort. We are trying to join forces uh, for offering these uh, webinars in, this, um, in the time of this uh, pandemic. So I would like to start with sharing uh, a few words about the Gender Equality uh, Academy project. So uh, I will start by with the challenge that uh, we are uh, trying to tackle. So currently, uh, there are many gender equality programs, projects, and growing knowledge and experience in gender equality and such topics. But there is a rather small proportion of researchers and practitioners that are familiar with uh, theoretical and methodological concepts of gender and feminist scholarship. So in this respect, the Gender Equality Academy project as an Horizon 2020 project funded by the Research and uh, Innovation Program develops and implements a high quality capacity building program on gender equality in research, innovation and higher education. In the realms of this uh, project, we are offering a series of training sessions uh, in different formats and in different topics. Due to the pandemic, we are now unable to offer any face-to-face -face sessions, but we hope that those will be up uh, very soon. At the moment, uh, we are preparing our open collaborative course that will be available on June for everyone to uh, get uh, connected with us and attend the, the course. And uh, of course, we are offering interactive webinars. You can find more information at our uh, website. We are a consortium of uh, 12 organizations all around Europe. I represent the Labs and Innovation Poll uh, in Greece and Cyprus, and I'm taking this webinar from my home office in Saloniki. 
I would like to let you know that we also have a YouTube channel, which is uh, called Gender Equality Academy EU, where this webinar and uh, all the other uh, webinars of Gender Equality Academy are uploaded, and this one will also be uploaded. And to let you know that we are live tweeting on, tweet, on the Twitter of uh, the G Academy EU and the Gearing Rows, so we would really like to know your thoughts and uh, would really like to see your tweets online. Uh, this is a brief introduction of the agenda of today's webinar on biases uh, on bias and resistances. So thank you very much uh, for the addition from my side. I'll give the word to Lucy now. Thank you, everybody. Um, I understand there were some problems with the sound. Could you tell me if it's okay now that we've changed presenter? Yes, okay, thanks. Uh, so thank you to Maria and to Vasya for the introduction. Welcome everybody to this webinar. Uh, I am Lucy Ferguson and I'll be moderating the webinar as well as giving a short presentation. The objectives of the webinar today are to understand the role of gender bias in leadership and decision making, explore resistance to, resistances to gender equality in leadership and decision making, and discuss strategies for tackling bias and resistances. We will uh, be keeping everybody muted because we've got a large number of participants. So the way that we'd like to proceed is the interaction will come through the chat facility. So please feel free at any time to type any comments or questions. I'll be collecting those as we go through the webinar and we will have a discussion after both presenters have spoken. So any questions, anything that comes to you uh, as we go through, please feel free to put that straight into the chat and I'll collect all those together. We will finish by 11.15 at the latest and uh, look forward to some interesting discussions. First of all, I'm going to pass to our first presenter, Maxime Forrest from Yellow Window, and he's going to talk about uh, bias. Thank you, Maxime. Yeah, thanks uh, um, giving me the floor, Lucy. I'm Maxime Forrest. I'm a gender uh, trainer at Yellow Window and a gender scholar at Sciences Po Paris. And I'm involved both in Gearing Role and, and Gender Equality uh, uh, Academy uh, project. And so I'm very happy to be with you uh, uh, today to, uh, for this first uh, discussion. Um, I think there is someone else uh, sharing the screen and it seems I cannot start sharing mine. Yeah, now I can. Here we go. Okay, so the title of my presentation is pretty long, so I, re I won't read it out loud. Uh, but, but the basic point of my discussion uh, is to uh, challenge uh, the um, commonplace idea that meritocracy is to be opposed uh, to gender equality and specifically uh, to positive actions uh, aiming at supporting or achieving uh, gender uh, equality. Sorry, I tried to get rid of something on my screen. Yeah, so um, are both uh, actually to be, uh, to be opposed? Um, um, what we noticed when we, uh, we try to support gender equality strategies or plans uh, to be unfolded in uh, uh, research uh, and academic institutions is that merit-based uh, recruitment and appointment processes are often opposed uh, to uh, the principle of positive action. And uh, in the particular area of research and the academia, this opposition also stems from uh, um, academic freedom, and the pursuit uh, of uh, research excellence and academic excellence. And uh, one of the results of this uh, situation, of these uh, hindrances, is that research performing organizations uh, in general are lagging behind uh, democratic bodies like parliaments, for instance, especially in uh, the case of uh, members of the European Union, but also behind public administration and ultimately even behind large private corporations uh, in ensuring equal access uh, to, uh, to leadership and, uh, and decision-making. And nevertheless, uh, 
one can uh, actually wonder why uh, both should be actually opposed to each other. And my argument in this presentation is precisely that they are not to be opposed. A gender biased notion of meritocracy by which individuals with uh, uh, different circumstances uh, be they uh, due to uh, social hindrances, uh, gender uh, origin or other aspect uh, are expected to take the same uh, path toward leadership position is actually the problem that you have, we have to tackle. And this we have to do precisely uh, in the sake uh, of, uh, for the sake of real meritocracy and excellence, a notion of meritocracy and excellence that will not be based on the reproduction of privileges or on premiums uh, which are not uh, uh, linked to uh, individual merits. So what's the problem? Because if uh, um, bodies uh, overseeing research at you and uh, national level uh, have been uh, worrisome and increasingly concerned with uh, the uh, access of, uh, of women to decision making, uh, it's because we have actually a problem. Uh, first, women are unevenly distributed across research areas, and that's about horizontal segregation. And this means technically that the pool of potential leaders are also very uneven depending on the research area, but also on the particular research area in a specific country. What we see from this uh, graph taken from she figure uh, 2015 uh, is that there is a very uneven uh, representation of women uh, uh, according to areas of research and uh, academic endeavor, from natural science uh, through uh, engineering and technology to humanities. And that this uneven distribution uh, is also uneven according to countries. What does it mean actually? Uh, first, it means that there are uh, um, uh, fields that are soaked uh, uh, to be uh, more uh, male or female or framed as such. Uh, but it means also that this distribution uh, is not based on uh, the same story and on the same uh, prejudices uh, in respective countries, depending on the path of institutionalization of each uh, uh, research area, for instance, but also based on uh, cultural uh, uh, factors. And no matter the side of the pool, Women are dropping out from uh, a so-called so -called leaky pipeline as we move up the career ladder and make their way to the top in uh, uh, even smaller and smaller number. And that's about vertical segregation. Uh, so whether we are in a field with a, a considerable amount of uh, female graduates, for instance, or PhD candidates, or in a field like um, system of information uh, or, or um, uh, computer engineering where there is much less female grade rate. Well, the leaky pipeline will work anyway and leave a smaller and even smaller proportion of women uh, uh, in position to pretend to leadership position. So gender ratios at different stage of the academic career are uh, pretty different. Uh, um, on the uh, left of your screen, we have the so-called CSER diagram that applies to the typical career path uh, in uh, uh, all discipline. And on the right, you have the situation, which is actually even worse uh, in the so-called STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, and uh, mathematics. And we see that uh, uh, in, in the case of all disciplines taken all together, uh, uh, there are actually more women on average in the EU involved in our education uh, uh, until the level of uh, PhD degree, uh, but this proportion is decreasing sharply along uh, the career path, leaving uh, less women in position to, uh, to take up leadership position. So unequal career pro uh, progression uh, is combined with lower access to leadership position, decision making, but also to resources. Uh, and that was this evidence in one of the studies that was actually carried out to reveal, to unravel the uneven access of male and female researcher to research grant, uh, which is very strongly connected in our context uh, uh, to uh, achieving leadership uh, position. So based on those problems that have been widely identified and documented, uh, we can challenge the uh, notion uh, that meritocracy is unbiased and especially unbiased with regard to uh, gender. Uh, there are many metaphors that have flourished 
uh, to uh, typify this situation based on vertical and horizontal segregation, like the sticky floors, the glass walls, and the glass uh, sailing. Uh, and, and by the way, what is also typical in the, in the illustration uh, that you have on the screen right now, uh, is that what it tells uh, of the, uh, the request made to uh, women applying to leadership position to stick to the norm, and that's here uh, to be seen also in our address. Um, the general effect of horizontal and vertical segregation has been described through metaphors, uh, as I said, and those are pointing out to different conditions or circumstances, definitely not merits for accessing leadership. The sticky floor is um, a discriminatory employment pattern, keeping workers, and primarily women, in the lower ranks of the job scale with lower mobility and invisible barriers to career advancement. That's a definition taken from the Thesaurus, uh, the glossary uh, put together by Hegel, by the European Institute for Gender Equality. Glass walls refer to women being often boxed into support functions with their own more limited upward mobility pattern. And that's something that we can see very much in research organization. Uh, uh, there is often this argument that, yeah, but we do have women in leadership position. Look at our uh, human resource uh, director or our, uh, our director for communication, for instance. Uh, but this type of uh, 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 functions are sought to be support functions, and there is a, a strong, um, um, uh, there is a little mobility, uh, horizontal mobility between those uh, pass and those uh, taking you up to other type of leadership position like financial one or scientific director, for instance. And the glass ceiling refers to uh, those artificial impediments and those invisible barriers that uh, actually oppose women's access to top decision making and managerial position, whether it is public uh, or private and in whatever domain, and this is uh, obviously especially strong in uh, research and the academia. So what we can actually challenge uh, through, this, uh, 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 through this perspective, through this gender lens, is that there will be a one-fits-all pattern of merit, as we can uh, uh, see from this uh, cartoon. Uh, academic power structures are very, res very resilient to change. Uh, and one of the reasons why they are so resilient to change is that they are dating from an era when women are usually more limited if at all, access to careers in higher education and research. There is obviously not the same story of institutionalization for all disciplines. Computer science uh, was born during World War II and, uh, and uh, physics or medicine were born during, let's say, uh, the Greek antiquity. Uh, or, but uh, there is definitely a pattern of institutionalization in condition that were evenly male dominated. And the, gender neutral or allegedly neutral pattern reflects in a number of aspects, including but not limited to uh, the expected credentials and achievements to attain leadership position, the patterns of dedication and commitment, notably time-wise, as well as the expected leadership skills from potential leaders, career progression patterns, as we said, when to achieve which stage of your, of your career and actually in which order with little flexibility as we know, but also the role of informal uh, and yet institutionalized practices in decision uh, making. Not everything by far, uh, by large is codified and uh, things do not always happen according uh, to the rules, but there is a no number of discussion which are lobby discussion uh, and uh, that also explains the role of peer selection and networking, uh, which are often uh, uh, leading to reproduction. And that's actually one of the main issues we uh, do face when challenging uh, uh, this situation. Uh, gender bias and inequalities are reproduced through leadership and decision-making positions or bodies, which are actually social or um, um, social instances uh, where uh, these uh, gender bias are being institutionalized, if not effectively challenged. And there are to that several aggravating factors that uh, contribute to this uh, uh, system of reproduction. Uh, the first one is the Matilda effect, coined by the historian of science, uh, Margaret Rossiter, back in 1993, uh, which is de uh, describing the uh, systematic invisibilization of women uh, in science. So 
when there are women in the room, actually, uh, women that could uh, legitimately uh, aspire to decision-making position, they are more at risk of seeing their own merit, credit, and contribution to research and science uh, being downplayed by their male uh, counterpart, according to the pattern of the Matilda uh, effect. And the second well-documented uh, uh, contributing factor is the role of unconscious bias and specifically unconscious gender bias uh, by which our brain is fit to quickly categorize people based on social or other characteristics as pertaining either to our in-group or to an out-group that we believe is not uh, uh, like us and not fit uh, for the purpose. And we know that this is ironically a byproduct of the efficiency of our brain. It is because we are very efficient at categorizing people based on previous experience, on prejudice, which is prejudicare in Latin, which is basically uh, what comes before an informed judgment. Uh, well, the byproduct of this efficiency uh, is actually discrimination. So what equal treatment is truly about once we uh, um, acknowledge uh, both the invisibilization of women, the gendered pattern of institutionalization of scientific disciplines and the role of uh, 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 gender bias, of unconscious bias in general? Well, it is about inclusion versus reproduction uh, because treating people the same uh, is not equivalent definitely to treating them equally. Actually, if it fails to take into account the different circumstances that affect their opportunity or their ability to conform to the standard norm expected uh, from them, then it is actually discriminatory. And uh, reversely, treating people differently is not equivalent to treating them discriminatorily. Because if it, aim, if it aims precisely at correcting bias and adapting the organizational culture uh, well, I would say to the reality, to the reality of life, of social roles of uh, men and women in society uh, and to their different circumstances, then it allows for people to achieve positions based on their own merits, which is uh, the point of meritocracy, I guess, not privileges or premiums. So if we place uh, uh, ourselves uh, on the path towards inclusive excellence, uh, we should be uh, uh, aware that universities and research organizations are increasingly bound to pursue excellence because we are in a highly constrained and competitive context and the situation is definitely not getting better uh, in the post-COVID-19 context. And this does not only mean recruiting and retaining best talent as it is often uh, uh, um, argued or advertised, but also favoring diversity to better address and anticipate actual needs of society to facilitate change and disruption, to tackle major global challenges, to exerting the social responsibility uh, ascribed to universities in educating uh, the society and bridging the gap with other public institutions. That's the one that I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation. So gender biased, unchallenged concept of meritocracy in every respect seems alien to these goals. So what next? Well, Rising awareness on unconscious bias can definitely help controlling them, but this, is, this has to be a systematic and uh, uh, um, uh, deliberate uh, um, approach. Challenging skills, measurements, and tacit patterns of merit through gender audits or participatory gender audits can definitely help as well. Positive action also help breaking the reproduction of imbalances and inequality, either through enlarging the pool of potential candidates by actively looking for them and not pretending they do not exist, through reviewing nomination processes to ensure gender balance by debuting informal processes, among others, through establishing quantitative targets for greater gender balance, and eventually, which is usually what triggers the most op uh, opposition or resistances uh, by adopting gender quotas as those uh, that have been adopted often after a long and heated debate in other merit-based selection processes with some success. And definitely 
by actively addressing resistances to change as a very part of the process of change. But this I will leave uh, uh, the ground to you see. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Maxime. Really interesting presentation. Uh, I am Lucy Ferguson. I work as a trainer for the Gender Equality Academy and also uh, a, a researcher on, uh, on gender training and structural change for gender equality. Today, thank you Maxime for setting, setting up my, my, my presentation and talk about how we address resistances to achieving gender equality in leadership and decision making. Uh, as Maxime uh, just said, resistances we understand as a key part of change, particularly uh, transformative change or disruptive change. I just want to start with um, a quotation by Fiona Mackay. We should celebrate as a success cases where the status quo has to start to work hard to reproduce itself and has to invest resources and energy in resisting gender change. The need for visible resistance to positive change is a success. It is evidence of the chipping away of patriarchy. It might be chipping away really slowly, but it is changing. So um, I just ask you to reflect for a moment on whether you agree with Fiona Mackay's uh, definition of resistances there and what they what they mean. Uh, feel free to write a comment in the chat or as we go along if you have a response to that quotation. When we um, look at these, yeah thank you Ines, if you could just write your uh, response in the chat please because we're not able to uh, to bring in a uh, discussion at this such a large webinar so please please put your comments in the chat. Uh, so uh, this quotation often divides a room. I find many think uh, agree with it and others find it uh, not enough, not good enough. So, so please feel free to add any comments or reflections as we go on and we can come back to it in the chat. So in terms of where we are up to on working with resistances, um, we are working at the moment as Yellow Window and as a collection of different structural change projects to develop a theory and practice of resistances. Um, we are collectively developing examples, bringing those together, collecting more and more examples, bringing these, uh, working harder on the definition of, of resistances and also categorization, how do we work better to understand different kinds of resistances. In doing this, we draw on a number of sources, including the Handbook on Resistance to Gender Equality in Academia, developed by the FESTA project, and uh, Emanuela Lombardo and Luke Megert's work on resistances to gender training. So we have a foundation there, um, and we're building on that theoretical foundation by engaging with these ideas in substantive ways in our workshops on resistances to structural change in various Horizon 2020 projects, which we've been conducting over the last few months and we continue to conduct uh, for, for different projects. We are also in the same collective way working to develop a toolkit for dealing with resistances. So um, I would say that the, the literature and theory on resistances is not as well developed as that on bias, as that on meritocracy. We are in an earlier stage of understanding resistances and developing how we address them. Uh, so I'm just letting you know that we're doing this in a very kind of participatory way and we are always looking for ideas on how to expand our work on resistances. And I think by its very nature it is something that needs to be done in a participatory way 
it's particularly a topic that can be addressed well in a face-to-face -face scenario when you can rehearse uh, particular situations, particular scenarios. And we are currently working to think about how those kinds of uh, very um, substantive face-to-face -face kinds of activities and learning experiences can be replicated in some way online. So that's an interesting uh, further challenge on how we're, we're working with resistances at the moment. We do, um, as I said, we are working on categorizing resistances. We're not the only people that have been doing this. We've been, this has been going on for a few years now. Um, and this is something that we present to our, our, our groups when we're in the training about like, how do we categorize resistance? How does it make sense to categorize resistances? Um, we have a rough framework of why are the resistances happening, how are the resistances being manifested, and who is um, who is resisting or what is resisting. Um, in terms of why, it's important to understand whether a resistance is um, specifically directed towards gender equality or whether there are other issues that are in play here which aren't necessarily to do with the, the, the political or the normative framework of gender equality and maybe about a whole host of other things, including things about um, system within the institution, resistances to change in general. As Maxime's already pointed out, uh, higher education is extremely resistant to change in general. So sometimes it's useful just to be very clear about whether we're, we're facing resistance to change in general, or is there something specific about gender equality that's happening here that we're in the resistance that we're experiencing. Secondly, um, how is the resistance being experienced? When I say how, uh, the resistance, I think we can talk about resistance to the implementation of gender equality plans, just to be more, more specific. Um, sometimes we experience resistances as very active and explicit. This can be through a range of different behaviours, from uh, outright rudeness, outright sexism, to open disagreement with the idea or concept of a gender equality plan. Uh, so that's on one side. And then on the other side, we have the more passive or implicit resistances. And um, these might be more difficult to identify and sometimes also more difficult to address because here we're talking about, um, in a lot of ways, inertia or, for example, uh, a commitment and agreement to do something in a face-to-face -face scenario, but then uh, lack of action. So we could call that a, a passive or an implicit resistance. And I imagine uh, everybody familiar with working on the implementation of gender equality plans will, uh, will, will recognise these different areas and categorizations. I can see the chats coming in, so I will look at those in a, in a, in a moment. Um, and then in terms of who, we have lots of debate about this category, whether it's useful and whether the, 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 the boundaries between the different uh, aspects. So we can say, is it an individual? Are we dealing specifically with one person? If we're dealing specifically with one person, then um, what, 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 where does that person's specific objection stem from? And also, how important and influential is that person in the process of implementation? Secondly, would be a group, perhaps a particular group of colleagues or a particular department of the, of the, of the university uh, or a particular subgroup that, that, that just seems to be very strongly working together to frustrate the implementation of gender equality plans. And then, of course, we also have institutional resistances, which we are studying and we need to study more the ways in which um, the secret lives of institutions and informal cultural rules, norms and practices work together to to generate resistances to the implementation of gender equality. So this is a very, um, a very rough sketch of how we're, we're categorising resistances in our work. Um, and 
I just thought you could take a moment to think about any examples of resistances to gender equality that you've experienced, specifically in terms of leadership and decision making. Perhaps coming back to um, Maxime's set of measures that can be enacted to, to address imbalance. What kinds of resistances have you experienced? And while you're reflecting on that, I'm just going to open the chat. I agree. No engagement means nothing is changing. Yes, I do agree, but I've not seen yet this visible resistance in practice. It raises the challenges to a more visible place where dialogue and awareness can evolve. I do agree, but I feel we can move faster, or at least try to. Our capacity to distinguish institutional inertia from institutionalized resistance is also at stake. Okay, uh, Maxime, in the discussion, I'm gonna ask you to uh, unpack that a little. Institutional inertia versus institutionalized resistance, yeah. The quote's focusing on a positive view to resistance, which may not be the experience of a lot of people, but I think there's definitely a merit in this attitude. In general, I agree, but actual resistances can also mean that the already gained success are in jeopardy and we face some kind of backlash. Placing institutions in a situation where they have to actively and explicitly defend the gendered order and power distribution, change agents get more grip over the debate and agency, but it's only the beginning of the path. Okay, we have some uh, issues around men's resistance, resistances in the form of lack of resources for gender equality, uh, supposedly feminine style of leadership as resistances. And then we have some, some further points and questions here. Invisible resistances, reproducing the model, i.e. nomination in the reduced old boy circle. Uh, another point uh, about the exclusion from the men's club as a major obstacle to could being considered for leadership conditions. Uh, reluctance to clarify or make official informal nomination procedures. Thank you. So we're having some interesting examples and these seem to be very much those living in the those kind of secret lives of institutions that we were just talking about. Um, coming back to some of these are institutional resistances in the sense that they're very strongly embedded in the culture of leadership and decision making of institutions and resistances to change in, in general. Um, okay we have lots of lots of comments coming through. Um, sometimes women have leadership positions on paper but are excluded by decisions in an informal way. Another resistance here that positive affirmation is against meritocracy, the same uh, debates that we dealt with in Maxime's presentation. And um, there's a question here uh, from Susanna, which I'm going to leave for the, um, for the discussion afterwards. Um, we want to work as well, of course, beyond just categorizing resistances to think about how we address those resistances. So um, if we move on with the presentation, we, in our workshops, we work on um, developing a, a plan per institution for detailing the um, resistances that are currently being experienced to implementation and also developing some strategies about how to, how to address those. So um, stage one, what we suggest is uh, identify the resistance. This seems obvious, but it, uh, it, in a lot of ways, uh, we find that in the trainings, in the face-to-face -face trainings, um, it's quite empowering to name the resistance and categorize it. And just as uh, some of the comments coming through here about the quotation from Fiona Mackay, demystifying the resistances and breaking them down and categorizing them and mapping them is an empowering exercise in itself because it can uh, 
make uh, the addressing the resistances seem more manageable and more, more possible. So identifying and categorizing in itself is quite an empowering exercise in order to, to lay things more clearly. Then something that we work on very much in the training is um, reactions to resistances. How do we react as individuals and as a team when we are faced with these kinds of resistances? So this, the first stage of this is an emotional reaction and a physical reaction and how we deal with how, how we can address uh, those in a kind of individual way, but also as a team, as a core team. Um, and then there's also the, the, the more strategic and political ways that we deal with those resistances. But what we're very clear about is that, first of all, we need to acknowledge how these affect us uh, as people and how that affects our behaviour. And that we may be able to be more effective if we're able to reflect a little on the way that we, uh, the way that we respond when in these kinds of situations, which can sometimes be very difficult, upsetting and stressful and just important to, to acknowledge that. But then in terms of being strategic, once we acknowledge our own, we can deal with our own emotional response. Uh, how, do we, how do we act strategically and politically? So um, something interesting to do is to set some objectives. Okay, so when we go into this meeting, this is the one thing that we need to get out of this meeting. For example, a meeting on discussing different uh, different methods for addressing bias in, in, in leadership and decision making. So um, what would be the minimal acceptable outcome as a team we would be happy to, to, to deal with. So, so we're already going in with a political strategy for addressing each resistance. And then stage two, develop, uh, work out which are the best techniques for addressing specific resistances. So this can be done by looking at categorization and also reviewing the kinds of, the kinds of um, techniques and tools that have worked well for other actors and other projects, sister projects. Um, so for example, five concrete action points for addressing this resistance. Um, moving on from this, then how, easy or difficult is this to address versus how important. I think something that we discuss a lot is how um, sometimes when we're working on, on structural change projects, we put a lot of energy into very, very visible, very strong resistances, for example, or one particular person or one particular group that tends to suck the energy of the project. And I think it's sometimes helpful to take a step back and say, okay, but how, how, how influential, how important is this resistance for the overall project? And also how, how able are we to really address this resistance? So allowing a more strategic look at the kinds of resistances and um, how much of our work and energy and time they are taking compared to how influential this person or group or practice is over the implementation. Uh, process. So that's another uh, tool that can be can be done to map out how we how we address different resistances and how we organize them. And so we can prioritize which resistances we want to address in which order. So just to finish, uh, coming on, coming back to the quotation and the more the broader discussion, why do resistances matter? Resistances matter because, as we know, there are persistent blockages to the implementation of gender equality plans, gender equality policies and programmes more broadly in higher education, but not just in higher education, in, in all institutions. Um, and resistances are a useful way for understanding the challenges and opportunities for institutional cultural shift. And um, engaging with resistances, as we know, is essential for a gender transformative approach and particularly in terms of sustainable and lasting structural change. So uh, thank you for listening to my presentation. We have lots of interesting comments in the, in the chat, which I'm going to, to look at now. In order to guide the discussion. I think what I'll do is uh, first of all 
take comments and questions for Maxime. So um, could you please let me know in the chat if you have any, any questions or comments to Maxime's presentation on, on uh, bias. Uh, the first point, while people are reflecting, Maxime, the first point is, was Juliet's point based on your images where you talked about, um, you know, their, 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 their dress and fitting in a certain way. And her comment was that all the women in these common images are white as well. And I think that might be an interesting starting point for, the, for this discussion. Yeah, actually, um, I don't think it was a purpose of this illustration. Uh, in my case, it was uh, to, to show also that, but uh, I think for those who design it, uh, they, they miss the point that they actually um, enlighten the reproduction of the, of the norm, uh, of, uh, of the dominant norm uh, in, a, in, a given, uh, in a given context. So if you are confronted uh, to, uh, to a, a sticky floor, um, glass uh, walls and to a glass ceiling, um, it is uh, also because you are expected to fully fit uh, one size and this one size in research and the academia is uh, the one, um, almost one single pattern uh, in generic term, despite the difference of context, uh, despite uh, the, the number of new paths uh, towards um, uh, field professorship, for instance, that have been emerging over the past decades. But despite these differences, there is still one single uh, one fits all uh, uh, pattern of academic uh, career uh, in terms of timing, in terms of type of responsibility you should exert at which point of this particular career. In the way you should look like, uh, behave like, uh, and what are the expectations? And those expectations are heavily gendered and they are institutionalized in a way that impedes you to move up the career ladder. Unless you fully stick, you pretend to fully stick to the norm, and uh, you make the, the different sacrifice that uh, go with it and which have little to do with your actual merit. Thank you. Juliet, does that address your, your, your original point? So I think there's a question about um, intersectionality here as well in the sense of we, we there are very much it's very much part of the mold is that you're all, you're a white woman and you wear the suit as well and you're able bodied and there are various aspects here which we uh, which we are, are are working on yet probably we've still got uh, more work to go in that sense. No, definitely. I mean, uh, with regard to, uh, to to intersectionality, I mean, when you address uh, gender bias uh, in research in generic term, uh, which tends to be non-intersectional one, uh, you actually necessarily uh, 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 face with uh, the impact of uh, intersecting inequalities. And, uh, and indeed, uh, uh, those pictures also reveal that, uh, this, uh, uh, that uh, the situation which affect uh, uh, able-bodied white women from uh, Western countries uh, um, is, uh, is uh, definitely uh, not the same as, uh, uh, as for people uh, who are placed at different uh, intersection between different stream of inequality or discrimination and uh, uh, but but the very rational uh, the very very working of those bias uh, is actually the same unless that it multiplies yeah thank you there's a comment from uh, Adeni about um, it's passed down through generations and this makes it more difficult to address uh, gender bias in leadership and decision making so a suggestion that the, the target of gender equality plans and structural change should be on the younger generation of potential leaders through proper education about gender equality and why it's important for a better society. Do you think that we address that uh, substantively with our, with our current approach to structural change? It's a question for me. Yeah, the general question, I can answer yeah. it as well. Yeah, I mean, um, to change, there is a trend, uh, I mean, often uh, there is a discussion about the focus. We, who you sh we should focus our efforts on. Is it on the top, le is it on the top mm -hmm. leadership? Exactly. Who is often the, the most uh, uh, reluctant to change, but we can make a, a quick difference uh, if uh, you get uh, him or her on board. 
um, or is it on uh, middle management who are the people who actually control the way an institution is working on a daily basis and are often off the picture of structural change or is it on the younger generation of future teachers and researchers actually uh, you, you, you have necessarily to scatter a little bit your effort between those different target groups because they all uh, help making a difference and you can hardly uh, forget any uh, of them and you can hardly uh, forget students as well because uh, they can leverage for change by asking for uh, quicker change by asking for more intersectionality which is usually uh, a point upon which they increasingly insist uh, um, at least in the institution I've been working uh, in. So um, we, we, we cannot really dismiss one or the other uh, target. Uh, that there will be it will help to support the younger generation uh, to adopt a different perspective, uh, but it is necessary also to bring the change right now, which involves people in position of decision making at this very moment. Okay, thank you. I think that's helpful also in terms of the resistances categorization in terms of which who are our target groups and how do we work differently to address different target groups. Um, I just got a couple more questions for you. Please, Maxime, from the chat, and then we'll go on to discuss the resistances. Um, from Lena, is attracting more men into lower positions a mean to tackle the sticky floor, or does it aggregate, aggravate the problem given the leaky pipeline? And I'll give you a, a second question, which I don't know if it's for you or for me. Uh, why, from Marek, why are top leaders so often reluctant to change? Be starting with uh, with uh, with the second one, which is indeed uh, that you will be able also to uh, to to address. Uh, that's a question that I'm actually wondering myself, having working been, been working in this realm for a while. Uh, we are in a context which is supposedly driven by change. Uh, we have to face societal climate uh, climate ma uh, ma migratory challenges all across the globe, and uh, research institutions and universities are meant to be part of the solution. Uh, we are in a context, in an academic context, which has been dramatically changing over the past decade in terms of funding, in terms of recruiting people, in terms of technology, of, uh, and especially in this COVID-19 situation of uh, distant learning and digitalization. And, uh, and, uh, and we are still facing uh, with people who have uh, difficulty to identify the agenda of change for their own institution. So it's not only about gender, it's about grasping change in general, and then gender coming to the picture and I think that gender can, uh, the gender perspective and an intersectional perspective can help those uh, people in leadership position to better address change in general terms. If they are not able to address gender bias and other type of, type of bias, how would they possibly uh, in capacity to tackle uh, big societal or climate challenges uh, uh, in, uh, with a full speed? And um, I, I'm not sure I get the other question about uh, attracting more men in, uh, in, uh, in lower rank position. I mean, men also go through lower rank position. The, the question is the mobility upward is different. <laughs> uh, they, 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 don't, they don't get as much stick there. Uh, and I think one of the, um, one of the differences uh, between men and women with regard to getting stuck uh, in lower rank position is about horizontal segregation is because uh, they are not, they, are, they can be also uh, lower in the scale, but they are not in the same type of position necessarily. And this gives them more possibility upward. So it is also about this, uh, these glass walls we have been talk, dealing uh, with. Okay, thank you very much, Maxi. Um, we can move on to have some discussion about the resistances now. There's lots of interesting uh, points and questions coming through. Um, I just wanted to ask you, please, Maxime, to clarify your point, which was about um, institutional inertia versus institutionalized resistance. Could you just uh, unpack that, please, a little bit? Yes, I, th I think basically um, uh, typology th that you have been mentioning are very important because we have a difficulty ourselves uh, being change agents or attempting to be uh, to identify um, um, inertia to distinguish between inertia uh, of the institution because there are ways of doing things because people are better seated that standing up uh, that applies to ourselves as well uh, because uh, it's uh, always more burdensome to provide change and to just reproduce what we have been doing and 
what is actually embedded institutionalized resistance to change and specifically uh, to gender. And we have to be uh, better equipped to, uh, to make this crucial distinction uh, because what is often presented as uh, inertia, as ways of doing things, is actually uh, a very conscious effort not to change and a very conscious type of resistance uh, because this status quo is benefiting uh, categories of people uh, and, uh, and uh, people in decision-making position in particular and therefore they are reluctant uh, both to change and to unravel the deliberate nature of their resistances but this you know more about than me. Yeah, thank you. I think that is a further, uh, a further useful uh, tweaking of the categorization that we that we need to take into account. And uh, every every discussion, every training is an opportunity to 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 refine these ideas. Um, there were a couple of key themes coming through in the chat, um, particularly interesting, and also following on from that point is about vested interests and reluctance to change being uh, really about about privilege and uh, and and power so that's why i thank you for those comments everybody that sent those through that's why i think that we are very focused on um as change agents and on training change agents working and thinking politically maxime as you always say that we need this is a this is a political it's political work it's strategic work and we don't necessarily always have the training to do that political or strategic work as academics as researchers so it's something that that, that 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 needs acknowledging and needs developing in its own right as skills but how do we actually address those vested interests and patriarchal structures within institutions and I think the answer here lies to that we work further with uh, dealing with privilege and we engage in a much more substantive and political way those top senior managers and decision makers in working on not just uh, not just giving a discursive commitment but actually uh, engaging in order to uh, to really give up some of that privilege and what does it mean and I think that we touch lightly on those ideas about giving up a privilege but I think that we we still got a way to go with that in our in our in our work especially if we're mostly tackling middle management and we leave the senior managers out of it and we don't really engage with those with the with the aspects of privilege so I think that's that's one answer but also just to continue thinking politically and strategically um, we have um, we have other ideas uh, questions about the the kind of what we call gender fatigue in the sense of we've been working on this for so long and uh change seems to be very slow and while it's good to to yes to agree with fiona mckay's reading yes we're having we're seeing some resistance but we there is still very very strong backlash against this and that's different in different contexts so how do we keep our motivation uh, and and momentum as as change agents and also how do we make this sustainable and i think it's really important this question of sustainability beyond the life of um structural change projects and we 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 work hard to keep the sustainability but um it, it's a it's a it's a it's a difficult challenge i think one of the issues in terms of motivation of us as, as groups of change agents and core teams of these projects um is that we we need to first of all acknowledge the toll that it can take understand the gender fatigue and do this kind of important care work as a team to make sure that 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 we don't reach burnout and that's another way of sustainability and i think that's the point about the resistances how we don't we have to be very careful uh, not to put all of our energy into lost causes so it's a case of measuring very carefully how the energy is spent and what what outcomes and what um, what strategies are most likely to lead to this political change and particularly in a sustainable way so that's my answer in terms of um, the how to keep the motivation going and how to continue the the the, the push for for structural change um, we have a, another five minutes for questions there's a, a lot of interesting points coming through in the chat it's going to be very interesting to to read the issues um 
to read it in detail. We unfortunately can't go through all the comments now. We're talking about um, psychological insecurity in some cases, and I think that's very that's a very good point in terms of when we when we when we categorise in terms of who's resisting and why. Sometimes they're very there can be personal issues that aren't necessarily completely related to gender equality, and that's a very useful to make those distinctions. Um, There's some points about different international contexts. Yeah, Maxime, you wanted to come in with a point? Yes, yeah, please I, I think there are also several questions, uh, several remarks about uh, women in leadership position being uh, often uh -huh. uh, um, perceived as, as even more reluctant to, uh, to, to bring about, to deliver change for gender mm -hmm. equality. Uh, actually, that's not very surprising. Uh, if, if, we, if we are um, here to, to, to challenge the, the norm uh, that uh, lead to reproduce power position and uh, career patterns and, uh, and, uh, and uh, conception about uh, uh, leadership skills and, and so on, and uh, if we admit that in male-dominated uh, uh, areas and, uh, and bodies and positions, uh, the women who make their way had to to some extent to stick to the norm and to demonstrate or over demonstrate uh, that they fully fit uh, the male dominated standard or the androcentric standard. Uh, it's no big wonder that they are uh, really tend to challenge the very standard that they have put so many efforts in uh, sticking to. <laughs> so um, 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 therefore the question is not so much about people, about individuals and what they can uh, do or the hand that they uh, um, the contribution they can make themselves because they are women in leadership position, but in further challenging collectively the standard and the norm of meritocracy and merit uh, as, uh, as such, uh, so that uh, future candidate, whatever their gender, whatever their origin, whatever their, their, the, the differences of their past will be judged on their merit and uh, uh, will not have to stick uh, to that uh, androcentric male uh, and uh, and uh, white norm. Yes, thank you. And this is something that comes up a lot in the trainings and the workshops on resistances about okay, but how do we deal with the with the women in senior leadership positions that, in a sense, are pulling up the ladder underneath them and don't really want to engage in gender equality issues. And I think this is another example of where it can be useful to really work out what's going on here with a particular uh, leader or a particular group and try and engage on. Uh, uh, yes, exactly. So how do we how do we deal with this? So one of the things that we look at in the trainings, for example, is uh, kind of rehearsing scenarios. And I think this can be very useful within the core team just to just to do a simple role play, just to rehearse how this situation normally goes and how could it go differently if we did things differently so it's just very simply changing small aspects of behavior one of the things we talk about for example is uh, like the meeting before the meeting so if you know there's a big meeting where you're hoping for someone's commitment uh, having a, a meeting with that person first talking on a one-to-one -one basis and trying to get some kind of commitment and understanding and what we understand what we can see and again it's coming through in the comments is that those commitments on a one-to-one -one basis or in an informal conversation often evaporate when that when that support is really needed so um, it's about using developing accountability developing shared accountability and this doesn't just apply to uh, women leaders who are resistant but really to all resistant leaders like shared accountability that can then be called upon at a later date for very simple techniques such as thanks um as we discussed in our meeting on tuesday and uh you know you you, you gave your 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 pledge to this particular policy so da, 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 da. so these are kind of simple techniques that we are developing that we can use but i don't think it's really enough just to have a, a written thing oh i'll do that because it's working politically, it's thinking politically, and it also has um, emotional baggage connected as well, as we've said. So I think really within core teams, it's, I can't stress enough how useful it is to rehearse the, the way that you're going to approach this scenario and, and have the support as well of the core team when you go in, because uh, working politically is not, is not easy and addressing resistances is not, is not easy. So the more we acknowledge that it's a challenging um, endeavor the more I think the more that we can uh, that we can have hope of addressing the resistances 
um, I think we're going to close the conversation now. Uh, we have lots of questions about dealing with uh, specific issues with resistances, which we can, and one particular here, how do we deal with the argument that gender equality in leadership positions will come naturally with time? And I think that there are lots of questions here about um, specific ways of addressing resistances. And um, I think what we can do is, is for these specific issues, to, uh, two things. One is to go back to the presentation here in terms of the, the steps for addressing them, categorizing, how do we react, what techniques can we use, what objectives would we like, what we'd like to see. And then um, the second part is working on a strategic framing, which we don't have time to discuss now, but there are other webinars on this point about uh, really packaging particular information and presenting it in a certain way in order to be the most effective. So strategic framing is another of our tools within this broader approach of working politically. Um, so I'm going to close the discussion there. Thank you to everybody for your, for your points. Um, I'm just going to pass now to uh, Maria, who's just going to say some words to close the webinar, and then Vasya will, will, will finish. So, thank you. Okay, thank you. I think it has been a very interesting webinar, which is already new before we started. It has introduced questions that are important to reflect on why, how, who, in terms of resistances. We have to assume that meritocracy has its own biases and we have to identify them and to denounce them. It's important to assume, to assume, uh, to assume that different values that is attributed to masculine and feminine and the incidence of the sexual division of the work and also the incidence of sexualization of female bodies and intersectional perspective. I thank you very much for your assistance and participation and thank you very much Lucy Ferguson and Maxine Forrest for their interesting presentations and uh, we see in the next webinar, I hope. Thank you, I hope that uh... Now uh, you can sound, uh, you can hear me well, and there is no pitching voice anymore. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, there is a bit. Oh, on the background. Okay, I'll try without those. Is it better now? Okay. Uh, so just uh, stay tuned because we uh, more webinars are coming for Gender Equality Academy. There is uh, one organized towards the end of May that will be announced very soon. Thank you very much, Maxime and Lucy, for all the very thought-provoking presentations and uh, the discussion, which I think this interactivity level was very interesting also for the participants. We managed to keep uh, a high level of participation. So thank you very much and uh, see you on our next webinars. Have a nice day.